How you doing everybody? So we put up a bit of a blog post there uh, earlier on about some tips and um, setups about dry dropper fishing. I got a lot of requests looking for more information on the setup, how I set up my dry dropper. So I decided to make a little bit of a video and show you all how, how I set up my dry dropper. Fairly basic setup that I use quite I use regularly on, on the rivers in competition and stuff like that. So um, getting right down to it, <clears throat> I got here my, my Viverelli reel that I normally use for dry dropper. On this here I got a three weight floating fly line, a Rome Scarry fly line on it. And um, that's kind of the fly line I use most times for dry dropper, okay, is, is that fly line, a three weight. Now I'd fish a three weight on a two weight fly rod for dry dropper. And I can fish it on a three weight as well. I got a little micro loop on the end of that as well, a bit myself. Um, now, when it comes to the tapered section of the leader for transfer of energy, for turnover and stuff like that, I do use a lot of formulas. We've spoke, I spoke of that in previous videos. I've given you a lot of formulas. Um, but also, you can use generic, generic leaders. Uh, Biscari Floyd, not a tapered leader there. Um, that one's a 5X. Um, use that one a bit as well, just for quick conveniency. But normally, if I'm building a tapered leader, it's around 260 to 280, and maybe three meters long of an aggressive taper. But I can use one of these here as well, just to show you the setup that I can use is quite easy um, without going through the whole complications of talking about formulas and building formulas and stuff like that. So this is a nine foot leader. So I'll just unravel it here um, first before I attach the fly line. I'm gonna make up this dry dropper leader on the line ready to fish. And you'll see the stages and the things we do to make it a make us effective, okay? Just unravel it across the fingers. Make sure there's no knots in it. And then I'll do a simple blood knot into my loop, okay? I use the blood knot for, for most of the nuts I use on fly time or fly fishing, I use a blood knot into the loop around five or six times and back in through the, the original loop there. And that's it. Right? Nice and simple. Moisten it always. Set that. And there we go. Okay. Nice, simple knot. I use it all the time. You know, when it comes to knots, use what you you're almost confident in. Okay. I always say. And for me, I use the, the, the blood knot for nearly, yeah, almost everything. Okay. Now it's nine foot long, 5X. Depending on where I'm fishing, sometimes I might shorten it down. Okay, I might shorten it down to six to six foot. I'll take it off the narrow section. Uh, sometimes I'll take a foot off the narrow section and take a foot off the, the heavy section. Depends on where I'm fishing, where I'm fishing small rivers, tight rivers, tight spots. I don't need a nine foot leader necessarily. Um, but for the sake of this video, just showing you as to how I set the whole thing up. Um down to the business end of things, I'll just use a nine foot leader for the moment. Okay, so if I'm on the river Nora, I'm on a nine foot leader. Okay, then onto the end of that, then I'm going to go to the chest pack here now, and I'm going to take out some shogun that I'm going to make this the rest of this leader with. Okay, so we're going to go with 0.12. This is what I generally use most time. Okay, so 0.12, I'm going to take that and I'm going to attach it to my tapered leader. Okay, using a double blood knot. So back to the blood knot again, I'm going to cross them over. Once I've been crossing the finger, I'm now tying the tapered leader here, doing the blood knot on the tapered leader. And then I'm doing my blood knot on my 0.12 shogun. Always moisten it before I lock it in, making sure there's no burn and it's not going to weaken that knot. Okay, I cleaned it up, trim away both tags. And now I've just attached, tip it onto my tapered leader. Okay. Going to take about 18 inches. A foot to 18 inches of that. And that's going to be my dropper material. For the next couple of times I go fly fishing. Okay. With dry dropper. I'm going to burn that up as I go along. When I've burnt that up, I'll add in a new piece of tippet there. Okay. So this is um, about 18 inches or so of tipping material in the 0.12. And I'm going to proceed on with the 0.12 as well to tie in my dropper. This is where the dry fly, we always tie the dry fly with a dropper. We don't tie it onto the bend of the hook and we don't tie it um, onto a tippet ring out the back, okay, of the dry fly. It's always on a dropper. Just to maximize the amount of fish I can catch on my dry fly. So once I've tied in my blood knot on that side, I'm now tying in my blood knot. Of course, the dropper is always coming from the piece of material that's going back to the spool. Again, just moisten it up before we set it in. There we go. Locks in place. Nice. Double blood. I always use it. So what I've always been using. Trim away my waist. And now you can see I have my dropper there. Probably a little bit long. But I can shorten it up. Okay. Dropper there. And that's where my dry fly is going to go. Shorten it up there to about three or four inches. Perfect. Okay. What I'll do then is I'll come down along here another 
eight to ten inches below the dry fly dropper. Okay, and I'm going to remove the point one two. Now at this point, you have a choice here. Okay, you can add in a tippet ring, or you can put in a perfection loop. All right, whichever you prefer. Okay, I'm not overly gone on, on tippet rings. I, I think it's a bit of a weak point, but uh, I'm going to tell you one. I'm just going to throw in a, a sky fly tippet ring. The two tippet rings that we do use is the hens extra extra small 1.5 mil tippet rings and we have Pascari fly tippet rings there as well they're two mils so I'm just going to throw in a Pascari fly tippet ring um or you say you can put in a perfection loop there okay I'm just going to throw in one of these tippet rings now I always say to people when you're using tippet rings do them at home because it saves you losing tippet rings let's just take a tippet ring off that there for a minute If you try doing them on the bank of the river, there's a good chance you're going to lose them. I'm wasting the finger, and I'll stay on the finger then. And I just want to get that onto the end of the... There we go. Once it's, tight, once it's onto our tippet, I will then do exactly what I've done all along with the knots. I'll make a blood knot. So around, around, around. I'm holding the tippet ring in my... Left hand here and just getting around to that. Back to its original loop, moisten it up and lock it into place. Put those tip rings back in before I lose them. Once it's good and tight, I can then clean up that. And there we have our tip ring. So we have our dropper, eight inches below. I have a tippet ring, okay? Now the whole key to success, as I mentioned in the blog post, is the distance between the dry fly and the nymph, okay? So the reason why I'm building it in this fashion is that we always want our nymph kind of one and a half times the depth of the river, okay? So that also involves me changing an awful lot, okay? So when I'm coming up a piece of river that's three foot deep in a room, as best you can guess, three foot deep, I'm gonna have that nymph four, four and a half foot below the dry fly in order for it to be on the bottom and to be effective because the nymph and the dry fly will never travel along the river directly under each other. It'll always be tailing back behind, okay? So you need to have that bit of a longer, longer tail on uh, longer distance between the dry fly and the nymph in order for the nymph to be on the bottom. Now, I, I chop and change quite a lot, okay? As I'm making my way through a piece of river um, and depending on the fish as well, like the fish behavior, how high they are in the water will determine the depth, the distance I'm going to fish between the dry fly and my, my nymph. So, Building a simple little setup like this, quite easy and simple. For one, it's point one two, so it's quite strong. Okay, I don't mind that being point one two. Okay, yes, I can fish it at point zero eight if I want because I'm on two h three weights or point one zero, but I, I find it more efficient to be fishing point one two there. Um, and if I crack off or if I get stuck in a tree or if I get broke, it's going to break at that tippet ring. I'm not going to lose my dry fly or my dry dropper, so I'm going to be very quick and get myself back fishing again because of that tippet ring and its placement there. Also, if I want to change depths, all I'm doing is changing the bit of tippet from the tippet ring to the nymph. I'm not resetting the whole thing up, okay? So it just allows me to be a hell of a lot faster and a hell of a lot more efficient, okay? From there, for me, it's always 0 0.08 shogun, okay? 0 0.08 shogun from there for me down to my nymph, okay? So let's just say, for example, one and a half times depth of the river, somewhere around three or four foot, okay? I'll add that into my tippet ring. And I'll do another blood knot. I say I will change that constantly going up through a piece of river. Not every cast or anything like that, but you know, every you know, every time there's a significant change in the depth of the river, or um I've after been catching some fish and all of a sudden I've stopped catching fish and I've moved up to the river. It could be a you know, the, the issue could be one that there's no fish there. Secondly, it could be that the depths have changed, and you might need to um you might need to change the depth of your, your nymph. So it just makes it really easy and convenient. So I come down then to my nymph. Okay, uh, going to stick on the dry fly here really quickly. I'm going to take out a dry fly for that there now and stick on a dry fly. Um, because part of setting this whole thing up is not just about building the to set up, it's also about how we prepare. So pick something that you can see. Okay, as I always have said, you've heard me saying it all the time before, your dry fly must achieve three things to be effective. Okay, one, it must be able to support the weight it's going to carry. So if I'm fishing a 2.5 or 3 mil, or even sometimes a 3.5 mil underneath that dry fly. It's got to be able to achieve, to carry that weight, okay? So let's try to... The brake lights of the camera now doesn't make this very easy, yeah. Uh...
this will make it for easy seeing that the eye of the fly and there could be a bit of dirt in it either a bit of dirt in that one I'm going to just take another one in this box here must have fished that one already there you go with this big clink so say it must be able to you must be able to, to support the weight it's going to carry secondly you must be able to see it okay so the visibility of the post there we go the visibility of the post is crucial here okay so i would have lots of different color posts depending on the water i'm fishing where i'm fishing uh will, will determine the color of the post i fish any color including black i find black very good in um in silver water when you're with no, with no background to the river once i got my clink tied in there I'll then come down and I'll tie a menu. It, it's worthwhile making these up at home. Put them onto a little um, plastic spool and have them made up ready to go. So if there's a problem on the river, then you know you got all this work done inside. Um, you're not distracted by rushing through the river trying to. I'll just take a little nymph at random here out of this box. And I'll tie on a nymph. So you got your nymph and you got your dry fly attached on now. The third thing for the dry fly, it's got to be able to catch fish, okay? And that's why I say don't tie onto the bend of the hook. Don't tie onto a, a tip of ring onto your dry fly. You're sacrificing that dry fly then. It's not going to swim properly. It's not going to be, um, when the trout come up to investigate it, you know, when they make that decision, are they going to take it or not? There's a good chance they won't take it if it's if the, the line is directly attached to the dry fly, i.e. out of the back of the hook or out of... Um, <clears throat> or over tippering where it's on a dropper like that it kind of sits slightly to the side and you get far more takes and hookups um on that um dry fly before i'm finished before i'm ready to go fishing with that i'm on the bank of the river imagine it's cut in the room chest pack here now uh i'm on the bank of the river and i'm ready to go fishing i gotta treat everything okay so we want everything from that fly line to that dry fly floating on the surface okay so what i'll do is I'll then take out some muslin, red or green muslin, whichever you prefer. I'll take out some muslin and I'll coat up that entire tapered leader, a bit of fly line, right to that dry fly. So everything sits directly on the surface of, of the water going to that dry fly. For the reason for that is I want contact that nymph, okay? So you imagine that nymph four, three or four foot or even longer. Sometimes I fish up to 10 foot below the dry fly, okay? But if a fish takes that, that dry, that, that nymph, Okay, and I go to strike and lift into that fish. I need contact direct to that dry fly so I can get the best impact I can on that nymph setting that hook. If there's any of that fly line or any of that tapered leader or tippet material to the dry fly under the water, well, then that will kind of dull the, the impact of the, the strike as such. Okay, because the fly, the fly, the, the dry fly will actually follow the path of your fly, your, your line or tippet, and it will kind of go under the water a little bit. Okay, so we want everything straight to that dry fly sitting on top of the water. It's absolutely crucial. What I'll do then is I'll get some mud. We have a scary fly mud there somewhere in a bag in this chest pack, and I'll get some mud and I'll mud everything from the dry fly down to the nymph. Okay, that makes everything's going to sink from that dry fly right down to the nymph. We'll be all mudded up and get the dry fly to penetrate as, as best we can. Okay, so I hope you all got that. Very simple little setup. Very, um, what would I say, efficient setup as regards that tapered ring placement and uh, your dropper and the size of materials means I could be quite effective at changing the crucial factors of changing the depth of that nymph very quickly. Also, if I break off and crack off, which does happen, no matter what you do, it, it's gonna happen. Um, sticking in a tree or sticking in a rock or whatever it may be, that, that's the weak point. It'll break there for me. And um, I still have my dropper and my, my tippet ring on there. And I can just quickly lash on a new piece of tippet, put on a new nymph, and I'm back on the water super quick. So hope that answered all your questions, folks. Hope you've got the gist of it. If anybody does have any questions, do reach out to us here at Piscari Fly, and we're always glad to help. Tight lines, everybody. See you all real soon.